Band 5, J-H-A.
to make myself very clear. If we uplink now, Skynet will be in control of your military. But you'll be in control of Skynet, right? That is correct, sir. Skynet. Does anyone need to use the repeater before we begin the 9 p.m. Skynet? Bravo 5, Oscar Zulu Lima. My name is Brendan. I'll be your net control for this session of the DARC Skynet. Skynet is a weekly net called every Saturday night at 9 p.m. concerning the subject of astronomy. Our purpose is to help amateurs become more familiar with the nighttime and daytime sky, astronomy, and space in general. This net is open to all amateurs interested in this topic, and we encourage your participation, comments, and suggestions for this net. Stations with priority or emergency traffic may enter the net at any time using the pro sign break break and your call sign. Is there any emergency or priority traffic? directed net. Please do not transmit without direction from net control. That would be me. And stations are reminded to ID at the end of your transmission. This weekly net operates on 146.88 megahertz with a PL tone of 110.9. Check, check ins via echo link are also possible using the W5FC-R station ID or echo link node 37247. Topics, astronomy charts, pictures, and live audio video links are available online. Go to www.w5fc.org right now for the complete list. Remember to tell others about this popular net.
Amateur operators are welcome. You need not be a member of any amateur radio club to participate. This net is 90 minutes long and is structured in several parts. Uh, first, we have general announcements. Then the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas events. National Space Society events. Discussion topic of the evening. What can you see in the sky tonight? A featured constellation or object or topic. Recent astronomical discoveries. Space exploration and space history. Visible satellite passages over the next couple of days. And astronomical Q&A. And if there's time, the 73 round. All right. All amateurs licensed to transmit on this frequency are invited to check in. Let's start with low power or short time check-ins. Please come now with your call sign name and where you're transmitting from this evening. Please come now. Hello, Golf 5, Juliet, Papa, November, Mark, and Oak Cliff, low power. Okay, we have KG5JPN, Mark, and KG5QXI, Gwen. We'll now take regular check-ins. Please come now. November 5, Bravo, Bravo, Bill and Irving. Charlie, X-Ray, Tom, Russo. Kilo Golf 5, Papa, Mike, and Richardson. This Kilo Golf 5, Echo, India, Uniform, David, St. Paul, Texas. Kilo Charlie 5, Oscar, Zulu, Tango. Carolyn and Louisville. Kilo, Foxtrot 5, Zulu, Bravo, Lima, Bill, Farmer's Branch. Kilo, Foxtrot 5, Delta, Echo, Bravo, Jason, Plano. Foxtrot 5, Juliet Hotel Alpha, Chaz Mesquite. Whiskey Will Golf 5, Whiskey Victor Lima, James and Carrollton. This Alpha Alpha 5, Alpha Hotel, Robert and Richardson. BB Bill, KE5 ICX Tom, KG5 P Mike, KG5 EIU David, KC5 OZT Carolyn, KF5 ZBL Bill, and the next one I uh, may need to fill on at KF5 um, Delta Echo Bravo and James. Is that correct? Alright, 
Houston, we have KF5JHA Chaz, KG5WVL James, and AA5AH Robert. Uh, let's take Echo Link now. Please come. Kilo 5, Juliet Delta Whiskey, John in Windy Norman, Oklahoma. Okay, uh, John, I'm sorry, I didn't get your prefix, I should know it, uh, but I don't. Uh, please come back with your whole call sign. No problem, maybe I came in too fast. Kilo 5, Juliet Delta Whiskey, K5 JDW, John in Norman, Oklahoma. Very much, K5 JDW John. Okay, I'll now take any check ins by any mode. Please come now. This is <coughs> November 5, Yankee Echo Oscar Stephen San Antonio. N5YEO Steven, welcome to the net all the way from San Antonio. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. We'll uh, pick up some more check ins later. First, a general announcement. Do we have any general announcements for this evening's net? They can be ham, astronomical space, or of general interest to licensed hams. Please come down. ICX, go ahead. Thank you, Ms. Brenda. Brenda, I just want to mention that we have the next um, Ketchall Lecture and Lab Day on Saturday, April 27th. This is when you'll have an opportunity to build one of the following, a digital multimeter. And let's see, what else? The Borg Cube an LED cube that lights up, uh, which is pretty cool, and also a audio signal, jeez, uh, I can't remember what it's called. I'll think of it, uh, injector. It, it will inject the signal over, the, um, over an audio uh, line or amplifier. Uh, those, uh, those items, uh, let's see, the DVM, if you want to get one, the cost is 20 bucks. That's what it cost me to order them from China. Uh, it's a pretty good meter, actually. It, was, uh, it looks a lot like a fluke, and it's got a nice large display on it, and it's a lot nicer than the ones from Harbor, Harbor Freight. So I think, think you'll like it when you see it. I'll, I'll post this on the W5FC.org website so you can see what the heck you're, you're thinking about getting. Uh, we also have the board cube, which is going, as I say, I said, was it $15 for that? Board cube is $20. I'll have a picture of that up, and then uh, the signal injector is five bucks. I found those from a previous lecture in the lab. I have, I don't know, four or five of those things. So if you want to, any of that, we'll be building it, and then also there's an opportunity to uh, follow up on APRS and draws. 
So if you're interested in that sort of thing, we'll be doing that kind of as a site. So it's a catch-all. Gosh, I've got all these things here. If you'd like them, they're available. And uh, just I get my cost back out of them. Uh, otherwise, they're going in for prizes for the club. Um, the next one will be Saturday, April 27th, at the um, Dallas uh, Medical Center. That's located at... I'm thinking, where is it located? At 7 Medical Center Way in Farmer's Branch. Look it up. That's at 635 and 35. Um, that's it from me, KE5ICX. Colin, you are uh, very weak, but speak slowly, and I'll try to copy you. Perhaps you can try a little bit. Okay, uh, the AMSAT Amateur Radio Satellite Group has two nets available to Dallas residents. On Tuesday evenings at 8 p.m. Central, you'll need Echolink installed and to be registered. You can find the net under Group and AMSAT. Also, a live audio link is available on their website, which is amsatnet.com. This net originates in Houston. Dallas AMSAT Net, Dallas Fort Worth, Texas. It's every Wednesday at 9 p.m. on the Arlington Repeater, 147.14 megahertz, PL tone 110.9 megahertz, positive offset. <clears throat> okay, this is not our last net for the night. Um, we we party hardy every Saturday night at 10:30. Uh, when the Skynet is over, we have the Afterglow net, and I'm going to call on KE5ICX to tell us about tonight's offering. Go ahead, Tom. Hey, Brenda, and this is KE5ICX. Creighton flipped the TV off. It was another Jerry Lewis comedy. That guy is getting on my nerves, he said. He turned to June, Eddie, Wally, and the Beav and asked, That's not, I'm not that annoying, am I? They all nodded in unison. Well, I'm going to go climb into a large coffee cup billboard they put up on Main Street. See ya, Cretan. And with that, the Beav left. Join us for that mid-century wonder, or not. I saw it for the first time in 20 years. Visit to a small planet from 1960, Saturday, tonight, at 10.30 p.m. This is KE5 ICX. Back to Hi, how did I miss that the main character's name was Creighton? <laughs> how fitting. All right, um, the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas events, when and where you can look through a telescope. Um, so, do um, KF5JHA, do you have any information on this? So, please come now. Thank you, Brenda. And how are all of you out there this fine, rainy evening? Uh, yes, the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas. Uh, you can find information about them on texasastro.org. Uh, they have a meeting on the fourth Friday of each month. That would be January through October. Then in November, they actually have it on the third Friday because otherwise the fourth Friday would be right up against Thanksgiving and no one would come. And then uh, December, there's a holiday thing oftentimes, so there's not a meeting during that month. So for 10 months out of the year, there's a meeting at the University of Texas at Dallas. Uh, that's on Campbell Road. It meets at 7.30. Make sure you park in the correct parking lot so you get a ticket. Details again about...
about that is on texasastro.org. So if it ever clears off on a Saturday night, the uh, Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas has star parties that are set up for almost every Saturday uh, during the month. On the first Saturday of each month, the Star Geezer Star Party happens at Spring Park in Garland. And all these happen right around dusk. Uh, Frisco Starfest is on the second Saturday in Frisco Commons Park in Frisco, of course. Cedar Hill Star Bowl is at J.W. Williams Park in Cedar Hill. And Stars on Rock is the Shores parking lot. Uh, park, <laughs> not parking lot. Is the Shores Park in Rockwall on the fourth Saturday of each month. They're looking at possibly doing something on the fifth Saturday. It happens about once every quarter. But so far, that's not set up. So, does anybody have any questions about the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas or where you could look your telescope? I find it interesting that in 2019, so far, every one of the observing stations for the Texas Astronomical Society have been canceled due to rain, soggy conditions, clouds, or something. KF5JJ, back to the control. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Chaz. That, is, that almost defies logic that they would all be rained out. There must be something going on on a, a higher level somewhere. All right, a National Space Society events and activities. Inside DB, do you have anything for us, Bill? Yes, I do. This is in 5BB. The National Space Society April meeting is tomorrow, Sunday, April the 14th. We will meet starting at 3.30 p.m. at Spring Creek Barbecue in Irving, which is at 3514 West Airport Freeway in Irving. This is directly across the highway from Irving Mall. It's on the southwest corner of Beltline, Road and Highway 183, not too far from the south entrance of the DFW airport. The speaker will be Alexandra Chica, who attended the first test launch of the SpaceX Demonstration Mission 1. This was on March the 18th of this year when SpaceX launched its Crew Dragon capsule to the ISS for the first time. So you might remember that occurred. It was uh, only last month. There's a lot of things going on with, with uh, spacecraft, human space flight uh, right now. This is a really active year. So uh, that occurred. Also something that just occurred was a flight of a very long, large aircraft, a uh, very long wingspan. I don't have the details with me, Tony May, but uh, it was uh, test launched. It's supposed to be, um, in the future, it'll have a rocket attached to it, and it will be launching spacecraft from an airplane. So what they'll do is they'll take off this airplane with a really long wingspan. They'll go up pretty high. They'll then launch an aircraft, which a rocket, which is kind of like an X-15, and then it will go up into space and deliver the spacecraft to low Earth orbit. That also occurred within the last few days. I think that's it for now in 5DB. so much, Bill. Um, before we get into our discussion, this discussion topic, I'll ask if we have any additional check-ins. Please come now. Andre and Dallas. Kilo Golf 5, Barbos of the Whiskey, Jay near Weatherford. Go, go, go. 
five, Whiskey, Sierra, Juliet, David, and East Dallas. I'm sorry, BZWJ and KG5 WSJ David. Welcome to the net. All right, we're going to call on Mike, KG5P, now to do our, our dis discussion topic of the evening. Go ahead, Mike. Okay, uh, Brenda, thank you very much. This is KG5P. Uh, tonight I'd like to talk about Einstein's photoelectric effect and, and what led up to it. Now Einstein, most people think that he got the uh, Nobel Prize for his work on relativity, but that's not true. He got his the 19 he was awarded the 1921 Nobel Prize for his work on photoelectric effect, and we see the photoelectric effect in just about everything we have including the equipment you're probably looking at right now. I can assure you you got photoelectric effect devices going on inside of them. Okay, last couple months or so we talked about black, rod black body radiation and why classical physics did not seem to work. What, what was observed was not exactly what was predicted. What classical physics predicted would be the end of the universe. And since that obviously didn't happen, so although accepting experimental understanding of black body radiation was quite extensive in the late 1800s, it was a problem. Attempts to explain the black body curves theoretically using classical physics failed and miserably so. Okay, we look at this Raleigh James James. Jeans, Raleigh Jeans diagram, and basically what Raleigh Jeans diagram tells us that the shorter a wavelength gets, the more energy it's going to have. So in theory, a black body radiation, a black body would limit, would would uh, basically uh, emit an infinite amount of energy, and thus destroy the universe. And the best. Scientific minds of the time, around the 1800s, worked for months to solve this problem. As we said, we looked at these diagrams of the experimental results, and they showed that the classical result cannot be valid since the curve diverges to infinity at high frequency, diverges from what really happens, which in turn implies that the black body radiates an infinite amount of energy. And this would occur on anything that was above absolute zero in temperature. Okay, this physical divergence at high frequencies is referred to as the ultraviolet capacity, uh, ultraviolet catastrophe. At a rooming college, it won't have a band called the ultraviolet catastrophe. I don't think you ever did. So along came a fellow named Max Planck. He was a German physicist. Died in 1947, around the time, the end of the Civil War, or around the time of the Civil War. He worked hard and long on this problem. Eventually, he was able to construct a mathematical formula that agreed with what was experimentally found at all frequencies. His next problem was, well, we needed equation to describe this. The only way he could do this, it turned out, was to make a really bold and unprecedented assumption. The radiation in a black body at some frequency f must be an integral multiple of some constant times the frequency. Means that the energy is quantized. So his formula says that E sub n equals n times h times f where n is 0, 1, 2, 3, or some integer, and not a fractional value. It has to be an integer. And h, a 
occurs all over physics, and this is known as the Planck's constant, named after him. This constant is recognized today as one of the most fundamental concepts of all nature, and it's on an equal footing with other constants, such as the speed of light in a vacuum and the rest mass of an electron. And this occurs everywhere in physics. The energy is quantized is quite a departure from classical physics in which energy can take any value at all and is related to the amplitude of a wave rather than its frequency. In Planck's calculation, the energy can only have discrete values of 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4 times this constant h times the frequency. Because of this quantization, it follows that the energy can change only in quantum jumps. And these jumps can be no smaller than hf, this constant times the frequency. So it, it can change only in quantum jumps of energy as the system goes from one quantum state to another. In other words, it, it doesn't go up in a smooth fashion. It goes up in a jumping fashion. This fund fundamental increment or quantum of energy is incredibly small. And I won't tell you what it is because it would just put you to sleep, but it's, it's on the, it's on the uh, power of 10 to the minus 34, which is pretty darn small, really small. That'd be a, 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 a decimal point in 33 zeros and then a 34, or a decimal point in 33 zeros and then a 6. That's why we have to use scientific notation, or else we'd be talking zeros all night long. So the, clearly the, the quantum numbers in a typical macroscopic system, that's the world that we live in, large, much larger than that. As a result, a change in one quantum number is completely insignificant and undetectable. Also, the change in energy from one quantum, quantum state to the next is so small that it, that it can be measured with a typical experiment. Hence, for all practical purposes, the energy of a macroscopic system, the system that we live in, seems to change by small increments or even continuously. In contrast, in an atomic system, the energy jumps are of great importance. Returning to the ultraviolet catastrophe, Planck's Hypothesis removes a non-physical divergence at high frequency predicted by classical physics. In Planck's theory, the higher the frequency, the greater the quantum of energy. So energy is re directly related to frequency and not amplitude. Therefore, as the frequency is increased, the amount of energy required even for the smallest quantum jumps, that increases as well. And since the black body has only finite amount of energy, it simply cannot supply the large amount of energy required to produce an extremely high frequency quantum jump and cause the end of the universe. As a result, the amount of radiation at high frequency drops off towards zero, and this happens around in the ultraviolet range, and hence the name, the ultraviolet catastrophe. If energy quantizations leads to an adequate description of the experimental results for black body radiation. Still, this theory was troubling, and even to Planck, it was not complete, to him and to also many other physicists. So the idea of energy quantization worked, at least in this case. It seemed to be maybe ad hoc and more of a mathematical than a true representation of nature. But with the work of Einstein, however, the misgivings about quantum theory began to fade away. From Planck's point of view, energy quantization in a black body was related to these quantized, vi quantized vibrations of atoms in, within the walls of the black body. And we also talked about, uh, this, uh, say you had a string and you tied it at both ends and you can produce standing waves that can occur only at discrete frequencies. So. Perhaps atoms vibrating in a black body behave sort of in that manner, in that manner, uh, vibrating only with certain discrete energies. 
certainly Planck did not think that the light in a black body had a quantized energy, since most physicists at the time thought of light as being a wave, which can have energy, any energy at all. Along comes a young upstart named Albert Einstein. He took this idea of quantized energy very seriously and applied it to the radiation in the black body. He proposed that light comes in bundles of energy, which he called photons, and that they obey Planck's hypothesis of energy quantization. I can't say that word. That's to say the light of frequency F consists of photons, each with a given energy by the relation equal HF, the frequency times this magical constant. Thus, the energy in a, in a beam of light at frequency F, which you can also say is the color, can have values only of you know, 0F, 1F, 2F, 3F, and so on. Planck's initial reaction to Einstein's suggestion that he had gone too far with his idea of quantization was nonsense. As it turned out, nothing could have been further from the truth. In Einstein's model, we'll say we have a beam of light, which can be thought as a beam of particles, photons, each carrying the energy HF as we just described. If the beam is made more intense while keeping the frequency the same, the result is, is that the photons in the beam become more tightly packed so that more, more photons pass a given point in time. In this way, if you shine more photons on a given surface at a given time, you increase the energy delivered to the surface per unit time. But if you do that, each photon in the more intense beam still has exactly the same energy of light as those in a less intense beam. The energy of a typical photon in visible light is in the order of a, an electron volt. Now, that's not very much. Now, without getting into what an electron volt is, Uh, compared to, say, like the CERN accelerator, uh, that it produces energies at the level of 14 TeV, or four, 13 to 14 trillion electron volts. And so electron volts is about as, as low as we can measure, if we can measure them at all. Okay, Einstein applied his photon model of light to the photoelectric effect, which is, say, Suppose we have a beam of light and it hits the surface of a metal, it will eject an electron, hence the name photoelectric. It in a simple device where the incoming light ejects an electron, which is, he called it the photoelectron, but it's no different than any other electron. This electron is ejected from a metal plate called the emitter, and this, in his device, if the electron is then attracted to a, a collector plate, which is at a positive potential relative to the emitter, you'll get an electric current, which can be measured with an ammeter. A photocell works. You have light that uh, hits a metal. In this case, um, mo most of these are silicon, which is a, a semiconductor. It's one of these elements that's sort of halfway between a a conductor and a non-conductor, or a metal and a non-metal. But it produces uh, an electric current. Okay, so just as with black body radiation, this photo photoelectric effect exhibits behavior that's, uh, that's at odds with classical physics. So here's a couple areas of disagreement where classical and quantum physics disagree. predicts that a beam of light of any color, or in other words, frequency, can eject electrons as long as the beam has sufficient intensity. Okay, secondly, classical physics produce, or predicts that the maximum kinetic energy, kinetic energy is the energy of moving matter, by the way, the maximum kinetic energy of an ejected electron should increase as the intensity of 
the light beam is increased. In particular, the more energy the beam delivers to the metal, the more energy that any given electron can have as it is being ejected. are entirely reasonable. And from the classic, you know, the point of view of classical physics, uh, they're even necessary, but they simply do not agree with the experiments on the photoelectric effect. Okay, I'll get that right now. What are these experience, experiments? Well, they are this. Okay, the first one shows that to eject electrons, the incident light beam must have a frequency greater than what they call a certain minimum value referred to as the cutoff frequency. So if the frequency of the light is less than the cutoff, it will not eject electrons no matter how intense the light beam is. And it so happens that red light is below the frequency of the cutoff. So no matter how intense that light beam is, no electric effect, no electrons. When you get into the area around green light that has a shorter wavelength or a, or a higher frequency, then the photoelectric effect becomes, uh, it can, starts to become, be able to be observed. Okay, if the frequency of the light is greater than this cutoff frequency, which is about green light, and in blue light even more so, the effect of increasing the intensity is to increase the number of electrons that are emitted per second. of the electrons does not increase if you increase the intensity of the light. The kinetic energy depends only on the frequency of the light. So if the light's more intense, you get more electrons, but only when you increase the frequency do the uh, energies of the electrons increased. Thus, if the frequency of the light is greater than the cutoff frequency, the electron can leave the metal with a certain given kinetic energy. If the frequency is less than the cutoff, no electrons are ejected, no matter how intense the light beam is. And that goes back to the red and green thing I just talked about. Okay, secondly, the fact that a more intense beam of monochromatic, mon monochromatic which is a single color light, more photons per unit time to the metal, now that means that more electrons are ejected per unit time. Since each electron receives precisely the same amount of energy, the maximum kinetic energy is the same. The energy of the electrons is, is the same regardless of the intensity of the light. All this tells us that Einstein was able to show that Planck's constant H appears in a natural way in uh, the photoelectric effect and is not just limited to black bodies. So that's sort of the end of my discussion here. Uh, the photoelectric is found all, photoelectric effect is found all over the place. In fact, on the amateur x-ray exam, if you decide to pursue it, and I hope you do if you don't already have one, uh, you'll find a couple questions that do have to do with photoelectric effect because there are a number of devices that rely exactly on this principle, one of which is, is that I mentioned before is solar cells. So uh, thanks uh, very much for hearing me out on this. I do appreciate it, and we'll come back in the future with more. Back to net, Brenda, KG5B. Thank you, Mike. That was very interesting. Okay, any additional check-ins? Five, Tango Mike, Tony in Dallas. I see him. Go ahead. But nothing yet. Just wanted to be an additional check-in. NT5, TM. Sorry, I thought you had checked in already. Well, welcome to the net, NT5 TM. Okay, our next section is What's Up from Chaz, KF5JHJ. Go ahead, Chaz. Uh, 
good evening, everyone. This is Chaz, K-F-5-J-H-A. My degree is in astrophysics. I work at Birdhaven Community College, and we call this segment of Skynet, What's Up? Uh, you know, we need to rename this. This is Skynet in 3D. If you didn't understand, we actually have three things going on all at the same time. You're hearing something with the RF, but there's also echo link and there's a chat session goes on and sometimes it has nothing to do with what's being talked about on the air and then there's video sometimes you might see spacecraft flying by okay this is your cue to pick up something there tom you know fly by something uh pictures star maps all sorts of things that go on on the video so sometimes things are happening in all three areas that are really not connected so it really is Skynet in 3D. I, I'm going to propose that as our renaming. Okay. When the moon rose at around 1.50 p.m. this afternoon, it was going through the open structure M44. It's also known as the Beehive Cluster. The moon is visible uh, in the daytime sky, but the stars in the Beehive Cluster are not visible during the day, so we couldn't have seen the event even if it had been clear. The moon was at its new phase on April the 5th, and the moon was at its first quarter phase on April the 12th. It will be full on April the 19th. The moon will be at its third quarter on April the 26th, and it will be back to new moon on May the 4th. Star Wars Day! May the 4th be with you. Okay. So the moon goes through a complete lunar cycle in about a month. The moon moves counterclockwise around the Earth in its orbit. New moon is the beginning of the lunar cycle when it is in alignment or in conjunction with the sun. This is an exact moment. In fact, on April the 5th, the moon was new at exactly 3.52 a.m. Central Daylight Time. Most of the time, we just say the new moon happens on a certain date, and we don't worry about the exact time. The name new moon is because it is at the beginning of the lunar cycle. We can't see a new moon for two reasons. It's very close to the sun in the sky, and the sunlit side of the moon is facing away from the Earth. If the moon covers up the sun, we have a solar eclipse. Uh, more about eclipses at another time at another sky net. When we see a thin crescent moon in the evening sky a couple of days after new moon, we call this a young moon. For several days after the new moon, we have what is known as a crescent moon. It looks like a fingernail or a smile. Uh, the moon is lit up on the right-hand side. The moon is getting more illuminated from one night to the next, so the moon is growing, or we use the word waxing. So the complete name for the moon we see in the evening sky for several days after new moon is called a waxing crescent. Waxing is what it's doing, which is growing, and crescent is its shape. Roughly every seven days we have a major phase of the moon. On April the 12th at 2.06 p.m. Central Daylight Time was the moment of first quarter moon. The name comes from the fact that the moon is one-fourth or one-quarter of the way around in the orbit of the Earth. So there are no dollars involved, just quarters. <laughs> okay. Between the first quarter phase and the full moon, we have what is known as the gibbous moon. The word gibbous means hump. So the part of the moon that's facing the Earth is more than halfway lit up. The moon is waxing from one night to the next. The total term for what we call this is a waxing gibbous moon. And the moon is still lit up on the right-hand side. April the 19th at 6.12 a.m. Central Daylight Time, the moon will be full. This is when the complete disk of the moon that is facing the Earth is illuminated, and the moon is in the opposite side of the sky from the sun. The full moon rises when the sun sets, and a full moon sets when the sun rises. If the full moon happens to travel into the shadow of the Earth at full moon, 
this is what we call a lunar eclipse. And again, we'll talk about eclipses during another Skynet in the future. For several days after a full moon, we have another gibbous moon. This time it is lit up on the left side and is getting smaller from one night to the next. So the shrinking is called waning. This period of the moon's phases is called the waning gibbous moon. On April the 26th at 5.19 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the moon will be at its third quarter phase. It is called that because it's three-fourths of the way around in the orbit of the Earth. Sometimes we call it the last quarter because the moon is about ready to complete its last quarter of its orbit around the Earth. And this is KF5JHA. And you're listening to Skynet. Between third quarter and full moon, the moon is again a crescent, but continues to shrink in illumination from one day to the next. We call this waning crescent moon. It is still lit up on the left-hand side. Sometimes we call this a very old moon, as opposed to a young moon when it was a crescent in the evening sky. Finally, on May the 4th, Star Wars Day, at 5.47 p.m. Central Daylight Time, the moon is back to its new phase, and we call this the start of the cycle, and it starts all over again. It takes about 29 and a half days for the entire cycle, just about the length of a month. And that's where we get the word month from. It really should be called a moon. So, speaking about the moon, have you heard about the new restaurant on the moon? The food is out of this world, but it has no atmosphere. <laughs> okay, I laugh at my own jokes. Now, we're talking about moon phases so much during this Skynet. Well, next week during Skynet, on the eve before Easter, I plan to talk about how we determine the date of Easter each year. And that depends, in part, on a particular full moon. I see your comments in Echo Link. Yeah, that joke was cheesy. Uh, moon making it out of cheese? Oh, okay, all right. Okay, let's get back to some information about the sky. On April 11th, Mercury was at its greatest western elongation, meaning it was at its highest point in the southeastern morning sky. Above and to the right of Mercury, you can see the very bright planet Venus. Then much further to the right and higher, you can see the much fainter Saturn. And to the right of Saturn, you can see Jupiter. To the right of Jupiter, you can see the bright star Antares. It's the brightest star in the constellation of Scorpius. This is all in the morning sky. In the evening sky, we can see the pale orange Mars just to the right of Aldebaran, the brightest star in Taurus the Bull. Event-wise, the moon and Regulus, the brightest star in Leo, will be in conjunction on April the 15th. That's Monday, tax day. And on April the 16th, the moon will be at Perigee, with a distance of 364,209 kilometers. Perigee is when the object is closest to the Earth in its orbit around the Earth. And the moon will be full, once again, on April the 19th. So we'll see the moon in the evening sky over the next week. The night of April the 22nd and 23rd, we have the Lear Meteor Shower. The meteor showers are named after the constellation from which they seem to originate. Lyra is where this seems to originate from. On a clear, moonless night, this meteor shower produces about 20 meteors per hour in the early morning sky. Unfortunately, this year, the waning gibbous moon is in the sky during the peaks. We might only see a few meteors in the morning sky. I've been talking a lot. Do any of you out there in Radio Land have any questions about what I was talking about? Need any fill on any information? Or maybe you just have a general a question on astronomy. I don't know everything, but I may know the answer to your question. Come now with your call sign if you have a question. Didn't hear anything. So
go, one for the road. Did you hear about the next mission to the moon that NASA will be hosting? It's taking a beehive and a pair of newlyweds. Yep. That's so the couple can enjoy moon honey on their honeymoon. <laughs> I need a rim shop right about now, don't I? Okay. This is Chaz, KF5JHA, and that's all for this week. What up? Uh, Brenda, can you help me out of this? Back to night control. KG5P. KG5P, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I read uh, that the Israelis had, had set up a moonshot, but th there's uh, there's augered in. It creamed into the surface of the moon. Too bad for them. KG-5P. Okay, and uh, thank you for Um Okay, any more check-ins? Come now. Yes. Number four, Mike Foxtrot, India, WB4MFI, Ted Dallas, low power. Foxtrot 5, Papa, Foxtrot Charlie, David, Carrollton, low power. Hello, Golf 5, Yankee, X ray, Alpha, David, and Richardson. WB4MFI Ted, KFI TFC David, and KG5YXA David. Alrighty, um, next up, Carolyn, KC5OZT is going to tell us about uh, Constellation. Go ahead, Carolyn. Tonight we're going to look at Canis Venatici. That means hunting dogs, and it was introduced by Havilius, who wanted to, who created it from all the faint stars under Ursa Major's tail. It's the 38th largest constellation, and in the Middle Ages it was identified with two dogs helped on a leash by Boethius, the herdsman. Because there was a mistake in translation about Tom, I guess, from Greek to Arabic uh, in T Tommy's text, some of the stars in Boethius represented the herdsman's club. Translator loosely translated it as the spear shaft with a hook. <laughs> when the Arabic phrase was used later, the translator mistook one of the words for one, which means dogs, and the Boethius was depicted for two dogs, and uh, so we just decided to find the dog's uh, position in the night sky. And, he named the northern dog Asterion, Little Star, and the southern one Chara, which refers to the star Betas, CBN. Charles is 
name of um, Charles Scarborough, who was a mass, mass, mathematician and physician, just Charles II, in honor of Charles I, the king executed after the English Civil War, and his new son was restored to the throne shortly after his death. Corcoran is a binary star. Brighter color is a chemically peculiar star, or class A. Classified as it's AP stroke BP star. One showing over an overabundance of certain metals. And it has an unusually strong magnetic field. 5,000 times as strong as the Earth. And its atmosphere has overabundances of europium, mercury, and silicon. It's a prototype of a class of variable stars. Alpha 2 canum venaticorum variables. Known for strong magnetic fields and um, they believe to produce enormous sort of star spots, which cause the luminosity to vary significantly during the star's rotation. The Great Diamond or Diamond of Virgo. Other stars in this asterism are Denebola and Leo, Spica and Virgo, Virgo and Arcturus and Boethys. The second brightest star is known as Chara, C H A R A. Magnitude. 4.26, and the name Char, originally used for the southern dog, means joy in Greek. And B, or Gamma, is well known as one of the reddest stars in the sky, and it was named La Superba because of its striking appearance. It's believed to be in the last stages of, of fusing helium into carbon, losing mass at a relatively fast rate, and is surrounded by a disk of ejected material. Most likely it will eject its outer layers uh, soon to form a nebula and become a white dwarf. the deep sky objects and there's quite a few here. The first one is M3, magnitude 6.2, and one of the bright, largest, brightest globular clusters known, about a third of or half million stars, and discovered by Herschel. They believe it to be about 8 billion years old. Then uh, we have the, one of the best known galaxies, uh, M51, the Whirlpool Galaxy. It's a grand giant spiral galaxy. Uh, about, 30, about 31 million light years from the Milky Way. So known as M51A, it's interacting with M51B, a dwarf galaxy. And they're connected by a tidal bridge full of interstellar dust and can be seen silhouetted, silhouetted against the center of the dwarf galaxy. Uh, M51b is highly distorted in shape because of the interaction with M51a, the Whirlpool galaxy. Uh, 
oil pool can be even be seen with binoculars, along with its companion galaxy. The M51 never sets for observers north of 43 degrees. They can easily be found by moving three and a half degrees to the southeast from Al Qaeda, and that's in the tip of the tail of uh, Ursa Major. Brightest galaxy in the M51 group. And again, we've got a group of galaxies uh, that includes uh, Sunflower, M51b, M50, and of course, Whirlpool, and several others NGC 5023, 5229, UGC 8313, and 
they can play out a physical pair and influence each other gravitationally somewhat. And better still, this enough not to be distorted by the interaction. We have two NGC 4656 and 4657. They have two names. Uh, one is, they're called the Hockey Stick Galaxies. Or they're also called the Crowbar Galaxy. And there are interacting galaxies about a magnitude 11. But it's an interesting little constellation, so unless anyone has any questions, Brenda, I'll turn it back to you, KC5OZT. Thank you very much, Carolyn. Uh, any, uh, let's take any additional check-ins now. segment is on um, recent astronomical discoveries, and I figured somebody else would surely do something on the uh, black hole image, uh, but they didn't, so I think I'll talk about that a little bit from a, it's an article in um, Science Daily. I know you've all seen the wonderful pictures, my favorite are where they become the, it becomes the eyes of a black cat, it's just so perfect. So, uh, working together as a virtual telescope, observatories around the world produce the first direct images of a black hole. Images reveal a supermassive black hole at the heart of the Messier 87 galaxy. An international team of over 200 astronomers, including scientists from MIT's Haystack Observatory, has captured the first direct images of a black hole. They accomplished a remarkable feat by coordinating the power of eight major radio observatories on four continents to work together at the virtual Earth-sized telescope. A series of papers published today in a special issue of Astrophysical Journal Letters. Uh, the team has revealed four images of the supermassive black hole at the heart of Messier 87, or M87, the galaxy within the Virgo galaxy cluster, 55 million light years from Earth. All four images show a central dark region surrounded by a ring of light that appears lopsided, brighter on one side than on, on the other. Albert Einstein, in his theory of general relativity, predicted the existence of black holes in the form of infinitely dense, compact regions in space. Their gravity is so extreme that nothing, not even light, can escape from within. By definition, black holes are invisible, but if a black hole is surrounded by light-emitting material, such as plasma, Einstein's equations predict that some of this material should create a shadow or an outline of the black hole and its boundary, also known as its event horizon. Based on the new images of M87, the scientists believe they are seeing a black hole's shadow for the first time in the form of the dark region at the center of each image. gravitational field will cause light to bend around the black hole, forming a bright ring around its silhouette, and will also cause the surrounding material to orbit around the object at close to, the, to light speed. The bright, lopsided ring in the new images offers visual confirmation of these effects. The material headed toward our vantage point as it rotates around appears brighter than the other side. From these images, 
theorists and modelers on the team have determined that the black hole is about 6.5 billion times as massive as our sun. Slight differences between each of the four images suggest that material is zipping around the black hole at lightning speed. This black hole is much bigger than the orbit of Neptune, and Neptune takes 200 years to go around the sun, says Jeffrey Crew, a research scientist at Haystack Observatory. With the M87 black hole being so massive, an orbiting planet would go around it within a week and be traveling at close to the speed of light. People tend to view the sky as something static, that things don't change in the heavens, or if they do, it's scales that are longer than a human lifetime says Vincent Fish, a research scientist at Haystack Observatory. But what we find for M87 is, at the very fine detail we have, objects change on the time scale of days. In the future, we can perhaps produce movies of these sources. Today, we're, starting, we're seeing the starting frames. These remarkable new images of the M87 black hole prove that Einstein was right Yet again, says Maria Zuber, MIT's Vice President for Research, and the E.A. Griswold Professor of Geophysics in the Department of Earth Astro Atmospheric and Planetary Sciences. The discovery was enabled by advances in digital systems at which haystack engineers have long excelled. The images were taken by the Event Horizon Telescope, or EHT, a uh, planet scale array comprising eight radio telescopes, each in a remote high altitude environment, including the mountain top, tops of Hawaii, Spain's Sierra Nevada, the Chilean desert, and the Antarctic ice sheet. On any given day, each telescope operates independently, observing astrophysical objects that emit faint radio waves. However, a black hole is infinitely smaller and darker than any other radio source in the sky. To see it clearly, astronomers need to use very short wavelengths, in this case 1.3 millimeters, that can cut through the clouds of material between a black hole and the Earth. The term of a black hole also requires a magnification or angular resolution equivalent to reading a text on a phone in New York from a sideway, sidewalk cafe in Paris. A telescope's angular resolution increases with the size of its receiving dish. However, even the largest radio telescopes on Earth are nowhere near big enough to see a black hole. But when multiple radio sources, separated by very large distances, are synchronized and focused on a single source in the sky, they can operate as one very large radio dish through a technique known as very long baseline interferometry tree, or VLBI. Their combined angular resolution as a result can be vastly improved. For EHT, for eight participating telescopes summed up to a virtual radio dish as big as the Earth, with the ability to resolve an object down to 20 micro arc seconds, about 3 million times sharper than 2020 vision. By happy coincidence, that's about the precision required to view a black hole, according to Einstein's equations. Nature was kind to us and gave us something just big enough to see by using state-of-the-art equipment and techniques, says Crew, co-leader of the EHT Correlation Working Group and the ALMA Observatory VLBI team. There's a lot more to this article. We don't really have time to read it because we're running late. So, I'm going to turn this over to Tony now. I think that's what's next in T5TM uh, with Space Exploration News. Go ahead, Tony. Linda, yeah, I was sure you would have picked the black hole, so I didn't. But maybe in the future we'll coordinate so we don't... Uh, leave out something so important. Thank you for filling that in at the last minute because it was very important. Uh, I'll go pretty quickly here. Uh, we did have a couple of uh, news items. Uh, the little space probe that could, the Beresheet probe from uh, Team Space IL, unfortunately crashed into the lunar surface on Tuesday. Now, that wasn't the biggest space-related news, which was, of course, the Falcon Heavy launch, but if you missed that and didn't read about it, well, we can't help you here. Of course you heard all about that one on your own. Uh, 
So Vera Sheet unfortunately did collide with the moon. They seem to have had a technical glitch. The main engine switched off uh, and could not be restarted in time uh, to avoid striking the moon at high speed. But they have vowed that they will try again. Uh, I don't know the exact details of that, but they're definitely going to go for it. NASA did release the results of its twin study. Uh, this was conducted uh, using twin astronauts Mark and Scott Kelly. Mark remained on Earth while Scott spent a year on the International Space Station. Uh, about 7% of Scott's genes may have long-term changes in expression. Uh, however, it looks like the vast majority of changes they measured, and they did everything, lots of blood chemistry, very careful DNA profiling, uh, the vast majority of the changes uh, in Scott's body during the year-long space flight were associated with prolonged stress and low air pressure, and most of them did return to normal uh, after his flight. On a space flight of birthday, I wanted to point out on April 10, 1919, John C. Hubolt was born. Now, who's this guy? He's the inventor of lore. What's that? It's how we got to the moon with just one Saturn V, not three. Lunar Orbit Rendezvous, the idea of sending a separate lunar module down to the moon with the astronauts and then coming back up to the Earth return capsule. At the time he proposed this, it was widely thought to be impossible. One senior engineer joked he's got a way to get them to the moon, but maybe a 2% chance of getting them back. For engineering work convinced uh, leaders like Werner von Braun that lunar orbit rendezvous was not only practical, but the only thing that would work. Although some of his estimates were a little off, he underestimated the weight of the lunar module, uh, it really was the only thing that had a chance of getting us there in time. On April 7, 2001, well, wait, we're back in this week in space history. Mars Odyssey launched. It was sometimes known, in fact, as the 2001 Mars Odyssey. Uh, it broke the record for the longest serving spacecraft at Mars back in December of 2010, uh, and it's still operating productively. It has enough propellant to function until 2025. Uh, Mars Odyssey was originally launched to detect water, and in particular subsurface water, by making careful spectral observations of the Martian surface. Uh, in fact, it detected large amounts of hydrogen, suggesting that there is ice lying within a meter of much of the planet's surface, uh, and in fact mapped this distribution uh, and found a great deal of that ice and water near the equator where it was previously unknown. bit of trivia, the spacecraft was originally going to be called Ares, not an original name for a Mars probe, uh, but NASA then asked Arthur Clarke if they could name it after, after his movie and book. Uh, he said, sure, go ahead. He'd be delighted. So they went ahead and went back to their original name, the 2001 Mars Odyssey. On April 9, 1959, the Mercury 7 astronauts were selected. Uh, later called Astronaut Group 1, they piloted all the crewed space flights of the Mercury program between 1961 and 1963. Uh, they also flew on all of the NASA crewed orbital programs of the 20th century, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and even the Space Shuttle. Uh, Gus Grissom was the first of the Mercury 7 to pass away back in 1967 in the Apollo 1 fire. All the others survived past retirement. Uh, John Glenn not only became the first American into orbit, but the only Mercury astronaut to fly on the space shuttle. He became the oldest person to fly into space, and he was the last living member of the Mercury 7 when he died in 2016 at the age of 95. April 11, 1970, Apollo 13 was launched. This was the seventh manned mission in the Apollo space program and the third that was intended to land on the moon. But of course, they had a very big problem and they did not go to land on the moon. They passed the moon in a uh, free return trajectory, resulting in a curious fact. They set an absolute altitude record for the farthest humans have ever been from the center of the Earth. Hardship and 
with the help of a great deal of assistance from Mission Control, they did return safely to Earth six days after their launch. I'm going to deliberately skip my next item, uh, just so I can talk a lot about it. So, Tom, if you're doing the slideshow, I'm going to come back to the Russian item. Uh, on April 12, 1981, we had the first flight of a space shuttle. Columbia took off in STS-1, piloted by NASA legend John Young, who was a Jiminy and Apollo pilot, and Robert Crippen. Uh, it was the first crewed American space flight since the Apollo Soyuz test project way back in 1975. It was the only new first flight of an American spacecraft to carry a crew. All the others had been tested on crewed. Uh, although it was preceded by in-atmosphere testing, uh, there was a great deal of worry about its vulnerable thermal protection tiles. Last but not least, Poyakali, let's go. April 12th, 1961, Yuri's Day. The first flight of Vostok 1. We can't leave this one out. The era of human spaceflight began this past week, back in 1961, when Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin became the first human being to orbit the Earth. He made a single orbit in his Vostok spacecraft. Since then, astronauts who have honored him with uh, special traditions whenever they blast off uh, from the uh, former Soviet Union. Uh, they plant trees, they sign the guest book they signed, and they plant flowers uh, at his memorial in Red Square. There were many unusual facts about this spacecraft. There was a single retro rocket engine, and because of weight constraints, it had no backup. So the spacecraft was deliberately launched into a very low orbit and carried 10 days of oxygen, food, and water so that he could re-enter by uh, just orbital decay if the retro rockets failed. Many famous pictures of him from orbit show the letters CCCP, in Russian that's SSSR for the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, were not originally part of his spacesuit. They were hand-painted onto his helmet by an engineer while he was being driven to the launch site. of American spy planes, the engineer was worried that if he landed in some isolated place without any national insignia on his spacesuit, he might be mistaken for a foreign spy. His entire spacecraft was meant to be controlled, the Gagarin spacecraft, entirely by automatic systems or from ground control. He had no access to the controls, supposedly. There was a special combination lock to get to the control panel, and if ground control thought he needed the controls, they would tell him what the combination was. However, none of the engineers and officials at the uh, Cosmodrome took that very seriously. Several people made sure he knew the code well before the launch. There was a bit of difficulty with his re-entry. Uh, the SIS module failed to separate properly from the uh, re-entry module. Uh, they had to let the uh, heat of re-entry burn through the connections. Uh, at which point his spacecraft did orient itself correctly, uh, but it was a scary and rough ride. He, because they were not able to design a cushioned landing system, he had to eject from his capsule before he landed, a fact that was Normal kept secret state. for many years. Shoot it into the rural Soviet Union near the tiny town of Saratov, uh, excuse me, near the tiny town of Engels in the Saratov region, uh, he was descending in a big orange safety pressure suit beneath a parachute, <laughs> and a farmer and her, her daughter observed this strange man in a strange falling from the sky. Uh, <laughs> they were initially very concerned, as might be expected. They started to run away in fear, but he shouted to them, Don't be afraid, I'm a Soviet citizen like you. I've just descended from space. Now, please help me find a telephone, because I need to call Moscow. They didn't even know exactly where he landed. They hadn't built their tracking network yet. He had to hike to a village and phone home. Well, that's the story of Vostok 1. Thank you very much for listening. This is NT5TM. Repeat the operational, and all my circuits are functioning perfectly. Afterglow Movie Net. KG5P, come here. KG5P, go ahead. Yeah, that CCCP that Tony mentioned, uh, it's SSSR, in Russian sense for Soviets, Sovietsky Socialistichskich Republic, Republic, 
which means USSR. Yeah. And also, Vostok in Russian means East. KG5P. Mike, and thanks, Tony, for that report. Uh, we're going to skip satellite passages because we are out of time. But does anybody want to check in at the last minute? Please come now. November 5, Whiskey Oscar India, William and Alan. Golf 5, Papa Charlie Mobile, Rockwall. Uh, had N5 WOI William and the next station I didn't get it all. Would you please repeat it? Golf, golf 5, Papa Charlie, Al, and Rockwall. Uh, AG5PC, um, Al. Okay, we had 24 hams tonight. And uh, thanks for everyone who checked in. We hope you'll join us here next week and every Saturday night at 9 p.m. to discuss astronomy, space, and space exploration. On this net, the sky is never the limit. We're always looking for net control stations for this and all the other DARC bets. If you'd like to try your hand at this, contact any of the net controls by sending an email to nats at w5fc.org. You can follow topics and discussion about this net astronomy in general on Facebook, and as well as our audio and video streams, video archives, and other useful internet resources by going to w5fc.org at the conclusion of this net. Until next Saturday night, this is WB5OZL, Brenda. I'll be closing the net at 10.31 local time. I'm returning the repeater to normal amateur use. Uh, let's meet back here in five minutes um, for Afterglow. And uh, 73, everybody, and enjoy the evening discovering the universe. WB5OZL clear. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Jess. MT5 PM.
Okay, I think I'm net control. I can't remember anymore. This is KE5 ISAC CX, Kilo Echo 5, India Charlie X ray. My name is Tom. Oh, wait. Brenda says it's her turn. We have secret back channel stuff. So Brenda's going to take it from here. This is KE5 ICX. Um, you did the last one, so it's my turn. And I don't think I can get out. I guess I should have pretended it was your turn, and you probably would not have uh, been aware. Uh, welcome to the Afterglow now. This is Whiskey Bravo 5, Oscar Zulu, Lima, Brenda, and DeSoto. And we have a stellar movie tonight. Uh, not picked out by me. The only movie I have ever suggested in all of these nets is The Creeping Terror, uh, which is the worst movie ever made. So it's not my fault. I didn't suggest it. Uh, but we're going to struggle to try and say something about this movie. So we'll see what happens. I'm going to call on KE5 ICX to give us his synopsis of this film. Uh, please go ahead, Tom. Right. Thank you, Miss Brenda. This is KE5 ICX, and uh, oh, what can I say? Um, visit to a small planet. This comes from my uh, actuaries at uh, Wikipedia, and I really mean that. Visit to a small planet is a 1960 American black and white science fiction comedy. I put a question mark after that. Film directed by Norman Tarog and starring oh, geez, Jerry Lewis, Joan Blackman, Earl Hallman. And Fred Clark, distributed by Paramount Pictures. It was produced by, hopefully, dead Albie Wallace. This to a Small Planet debuted on as an original television production by Gore Vidal, then was reworked by Vidal as a Broadway play starring Cyril Richard and Eddie Mayhoff. The film was released on February 4th, 1960. It was released in 1966 on a double bill with another Jerry Lewis film, The Bellboy. Here's the very deep plot. It's two paragraphs long. Creighton, what an apt name, is played by Jerry Lewis, is an alien from the planet X-47 who is fascinated by human beings. Against the wishes of his teacher, he repeatedly visits Earth. During his latest visit, his teacher reluctantly agrees to follow him to stay and study the humans. Creighton becomes friends with a suburban family and stays with them after they agree to keep his alien status a secret. Along the way, he falls in love with their daughter, Joan Blackman. However, there is a force field around him that prevents any physical contact. His race has a, any form of affection. After repeatedly breaking his teacher's rule against never getting involved in humans' lives, all of Creighton's powers are stripped away. This is so that he can discover for himself that being human comes with other less desired emotions like pain, sadness, and jealousy. Once his cover is blown on Earth and he is reported to the police, Creighton decides that those emotions are not worth the trouble, so he returns to his own planet. I don't even know where to begin. I won't begin. I was actually in a production of this. Uh, KE5 ICX, back to net control. Okay, thank you. This is WB5OZL. I'm going to take check-ins now. Uh, your name, oh, sorry, your call sign, your name, your location, and whether or not you admit to seeing this movie. Please, short time, low power first. Please come down. Remember Tango 5, Tango Mike, Tony, portable in Dallas. I did not see the movie. I'll be listening only, but thank you for being that control.
Early X-ray, Tom in Louisville. Uh, I fell asleep through half of it, but I guess I saw it. second time I've seen it. First time when I was a kid and time get you five easy W. This kid will go five Papa Mike November, James Fort Worth. I saw the movie. November, James Fort Worth, I saw the movie. Shall we 
jump in. Um, I'll say to start with, when I was a child, I thought Jerry Lewis was the funniest person in the world. And by the time I was about 12, I thought he was the stupidest. Um, so I've got mixed, uh, mixed feelings about this. Um, how, uh, you know, looking back on it now, uh, they call him the king of comedy. And, um, uh, he must have been doing something right, because everybody really liked him. But I found this thing almost unwatchable. Um, and it's just kind of not my sort of humor. But let's see what everybody else thinks. Uh, let's talk about the plot. Uh, MP5 TM Tony is not coming back. Um, so let's start with Mike KI5 EBO. Go ahead. Plot. Well, I sort of miss that, but I get the impression that you are not going to make comments. So we'll move on. KE5ICX. Tom, what do you think of the plot? Let me tell you something. This is Cora Vidal. He could write good stuff. Apparently, none of this ended up on screen. Now, I had picked this movie and put it on a list, oh, I don't know, two or three years ago, and it kept getting pushed down to the bottom of the list to a point where I didn't remember why I kept pushing it down on the list. Now I remember why. It's not good. But... The storyline, at least from, I, I didn't read the, the the story, I remember it as a play. I was in the play. I actually played Conrad in this, played by the world's oldest teenager, Earl Holloman, um, which is kind of embarrassing in and of itself. Uh, it's been 30 years since I've actually been in the show, and I've forgotten most of it, but I do remember a few things. One, the plot originally was better than this. Two, the plot didn't completely revolve around Cretan, even though it, 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 he was the principal character. Three, Jerry Lewis as Cretan is a Cretan, so I guess he lives up to the name. I, the idea of having some sort of a hu super... Uh, human or super race or whatever coming to Earth is not that unusual. Let me reset. The idea of having a child with superhuman capabilities is not original, but I mean, the, the, the gods, I think Hercules was uh, one of those. And this idea has been resurfaced surfaced in science fiction many, many, many times, and they used this idea as, or this story uh, concept over and over again, and with good effect. It was used in Star Trek with Charlie X, it was used in uh, The Squire of Gothos, another Star Trek episode with a superhuman childlike character played by, uh, was it John Campbell? Uh, it was used again in Star Trek with Q, uh, played by John Delancey. Uh, basically, it's the same idea that uh, superhuman capabilities uh, uh, can uh, lead to disaster or otherwise uh, difficult times for everybody else. And then that character realizes, hey, wait a minute, this is not a good idea. I need to uh, excuse myself from the situation. This is a blueprint for what you see. Unfortunately, this movie failed to really project that, at least to the point where I fell into a confused slumber. I do know this movie is very good for putting people to sleep. And that's all I have to say about the plot for now. KE5 ICX. Oh, I didn't.
didn't fall asleep. Um, I was afraid to fall asleep. Okay, KT5P Mike, go ahead. Okay, KT5P, well, thank you, Tom. You give us another forgettable movie. I like some of the actors, though. They had some fairly popular actors of those days, and some of some I actually liked. Uh, never was a big fan of Jerry Lewis, except in one movie that he made. He only made Jerry Lewis only made one movie that I liked, and that was The King of Comedy. But he played a totally different role. It wasn't the doofus shtick that he, you know, been in all with all the other ones playing the sidekick to Dean Martin and stuff. Okay, as far as the interbreeding with the species, well, the thing is, human beings are, we got like one chromosome difference from, from chimpanzees, and that they're our nearest relatives. We can't interbreed with them. We're closer to chimpanzees than we are to uh, some extraterrestrial form of life. We have to be. And we're even, clo we're even genetically closer to slime mold than we are to some extraterrestrial species that evolved independently. But this whole business of having offspring with some extraterrestrial form of life is just impossible. It can't be done. Absolutely not. I don't care who made the movie. I don't care if it was Mr. Spock, who had an Earth mother and a Vulcan father or any of that stuff. It's all nonsense. I like to talk about some of the characters, but I'll, I'll talk about that later. KG5P. All righty. Uh, Jay, KG5BZW. Go ahead. This is KQ5BZW. Um, yeah, uh, this isn't really that, I, what to call it, I don't really consider it a sci-fi film, even though, yeah, okay, it's got the sci-fi elements. Um, it's just a really kind of a really sim silly comedy. And, um, uh, sorry, I'm getting a little distracted by my, Okay, here. Um, I it I didn't really hate the film, which is kind of surprising. Um, it's actually it, it, I I I had really trouble uh, a lot of trouble getting into it, but once I I don't know maybe there's just a little bit of something that got me laughing and. Made, got me in the, the mood to, to see it, and this is one of those films I think you really have to be in a kind of a, a um, I don't know, blissful? I don't know what kind of mood you have to be in. You Probably uh, inebriated with alcohol would help. I was not inebriated. Um, <laughs> um, but, yeah, it, it's, 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 it's not... It's not, you know, serious sci-fi. Of course, it's not really attempting to be that either. But um, I don't know. I tried to enjoy it for what it was worth, um, which the, com the comedic aspects. Um, it was only when I got to watching it a, a little while that this plot just seems awfully familiar, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I've seen this once uh Went back in the day when they had, you know, um, m movies uh, being shown on the uh, UHF channels. Uh, probably one of those things that they show Jerry Lewis then Three Stooges or something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It, it, it's actually. Uh, Three Stooges, I think, uh, I was watching that, uh, flipping with them randomly, and I think they actually would beat uh, this film, um, which is actually kind of, 
I don't know, sad in a way, but uh, not that Three Stooges are, are awful, but I don't know, I'm getting on a tangent here. Let me reset. The plot, I don't know. It's I don't really want to analyze it because I, what little magic there is to it. Uh, it I don't know that there really is any magic, though. Um, it, it seems like one silly contrivance after another, which, I mean, it's supposed to make you laugh, I guess. So, Hello? Okay, I wasn't hearing myself on the radio. Um, the, 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 oh, shoot, I, I'm going to have a brain fire here. Um, can't rem- the the the, the uh, beatnik uh, club was was over the top silly. Um, <laughs> um, definitely stoner kind of something. Um, ah, I, I I'll let somebody else ha- have at it. Uh, this is a KG five BGW. Let's see who's next. Uh, KG5 PMN, James, go ahead. It's KG5 PMN. Um, start out with, I guess I'm not a Jerry Lewis fan, although I kind of enjoyed watching this movie. Um, it reminded me of a lot of elements. Uh, the plot kind of reminded me of the typical 60, early 60s uh, sitcoms. Um, I guess you kind of think of it as, as a extended 30-minute sitcom. Um, had elements of the Beverly Hillbillies in it and Bewitched and uh, maybe a few other things if I really sat, sat down and thought about them. But um, as far as the plot goes, I just kind of a... Just a running little plot with the guy going, coming to Earth and then going back. KG5 PMN, back to the net. Hey, um, Carolyn, KG5 OZT, go ahead. Uh, KF5TSK Burl, what do you think of the plot? Uh, this is KF5TSK. Well, I would say that I appreciate the fact that they didn't really uh, extend or stretch science. Uh, uh, you know, I didn't really feel insulted that... Uh, so there was this computer barking out orders or, uh, you know, that there was no computer anywhere, no, uh, I guess, voices or, uh, uh, you know, nothing really technical. You know, we just tug on our ear and put in the right number and, you know, you won't be able to lower your leg. Uh, it, you know, the plot moved along, the, uh, uh, you know, really think it's really entertaining, and, you know, it was meant that way. Uh, you know, it, uh, like I said, it, uh, there was nothing really that uh, seemed that unusual, you know. Uh, Everyone seemed to have the same spacecraft, and uh, um, you know, if you have all these wonderful things, why come to Earth? And, and uh, how smart were you to show up 99 years later than 
what you expected. Can't find his get back to that. Okay, thirty five E D V David. Go ahead. Delightful movie. I actually enjoyed it. And you, as you all know, I rarely say that about sci fi movies of this era. This is my outlier, I guess you could say. Uh, the movie had good street cred, professionally casted with well-known actors, uh, headliner Jerry Lewis. And actually, I found him somewhat restrained, which is, which is rare, and uh, his goofy uh, slapstick manner was uh, kind of in character. It wasn't too much of a, of a distraction. Uh, and the, uh, the costume designer for this movie was Edith Head, uh, I think she's won more Academy Awards than anyone else for costume design. Um, and even without Dean Martin, I thought it was pretty good. Um, the movie played well in France, so there's that. Um, now, something interesting on, on Wikipedia about this, and I didn't quite get this, but I guess in retrospect it may be true. Uh, Gore Vidal intended to play as a satire on the post-World War II fear of communism in, in the U.S., McCarthyism, Cold War, military paranoia, and the rising importance of, of television in American life. I, I guess, so maybe that comes across more in the plays versus in this particular movie. Um, but I think the main message, the main takeaway or moral of this, of this is if you are an alien, whether visiting or living among us, um, you might want to keep that a secret. W5EBB. Well, then there's no uh, sitcom. I was just thinking about all of the shows where the shtick is an alien comes to Earth, uh, like My Favorite Martian and Mork from Mork, uh, Mork and Mindy, um, and, you know, and or even I Dream of Genie is kind of similar where somebody is different, we have to keep it a secret, or not, and, um, and, and the humor arises from the um, intersection of the two conflicting cultures, uh, and, and obviously it, it's a good vehicle for Jerry Lewis to do his pratfalls and his goofy looks and uh, all the misunderstandings. <sighs> And such. He wasn't very believable as an alien. Uh, he's believable as a the buffoon Jerry Lewis. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, obviously, there's a market there. He made a lot of movies and a lot of money, and the French honored him with his big award. So who am I to throw water on that? Uh, the plot was okay. It, you know, it made sense. It followed uh, in a linear fashion, and. Uh, didn't really insult our intelligence. Um, I was reading about Jerry Lewis. One interesting thing is that he, for uh, some years, he um, taught film directing at USC, and George Lucas was in his class, and he brought along his pal Steven Spielberg to sit, sit in on it. So uh, that tells you something. That's where they learn, learn the craft. So he must have something going on. All right. Uh, do we have any more check-ins? EBO did not see the movie, so we want to um, check him, uh, put him on the list. KE5 ICX Tom, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Miss Brenda. Uh, well, Creighton was supposed to be a character that was childlike, but at the same time, you know, the superhuman. Super, uh, uh, superior uh, uh, creature, whatever you want to call him, uh, extraterrestrial. 
And Jerry Lewis totally ineptly handles that character, I think. Uh, I, I'm sorry, not a great Jerry Lewis fan. Uh, I think, what was it? Not The Entertainer, the, the one that was mentioned by uh, Mike, KG5P. Uh, I heard that, that he'd done a good job with that. So uh, I'll go with that as far as the actor is concerned, Jerry Lewis. Uh, other than that, I really don't like him in anything he does. This is no exception. Uh, he takes the Cretan character, who, which should be bombastic, but somewhat credible and likable in the end. Um, he's none of those things in this movie which is really unfortunate. I'm really happy that he goes back to his spaceship, and I kept hoping, although I fell asleep, but I imagined while the thing was droning on in the background that his spaceship would be blown up. The character Conrad, which I have some affinity with, uh, played by Earl Holloman. Earl Holloman is totally miscast in this as uh, Conrad. The character should be younger, uh, better looking, more capable, intelligence, fantastic. I was typecast into this role at the time that I did it, of course. So uh, Earl's wrong, although he does a pretty good job on, ben, uh, on uh, Forbidden Planet and getting his space gin. So uh, I think that's how he ended up in this role. Uh, the other characters are pretty much to be expected, uh, pretty much stereotypical 1950s, 1960s stuff, back and forth. Um, uh, all right, I, uh, I don't know what to say. The play was much better. Uh, the characterizations were better. The characters were all pretty much... Oh, well, let me say this. Maybe I can say this. Let me reset. It is a post-World War II thing. We've got the Red Menace, meaning we've got to deal with the Soviet Union at the time, trying to figure out how the heck we're going to deal with uh, anything that should happen in the future. And we do so by tea and crumpets. Not tea and crumpets. What we do? Coffee and donuts. That's it. Coffee and donuts works. And everybody kind of plays it matter-of-factly. Uh, that seems to help the story, but doesn't hinder uh, the forward, hinder, hinder the stereotypes that we're trying to create. So I don't know. I, don't know, I, I was kind of disappointed in it, uh, even from a characterization standpoint. Great actors, lots of folks in it. Ellen Corby, we remember her from, what was it, uh, uh, the, uh, the Waltons, and some other stuff. Of course, we've got other characters here. Gail Gordon from uh, I Love Lucy. That should tell you something about what they're trying to, to go for. But again, it's supposed to be a comedy with some thoughtful parts. Gore Vidal should have wanted them to, to uh, he shouldn't have allowed it to happen. Anyway, uh, KE5ICX, back to that. Uh, very good. KG5P Mike, characters. Okay, thank you. KG5P. Well, I mentioned I was never a Jerry Lewis fan because I just couldn't get with his slapstick, squeaky little voice shtick, which was what he always seemed to do. I did see him in one movie, I'd mentioned this before, it was The King of Comedy. It said it was his last movie, but it wasn't. It was in 1982, and he made a number of them later, so I might have to go back and see if I can find him and watch his later movies. The King of Comedy was great. It was kind of a, I'm not sure if it's a draw, if he called it drama or a dark comedy, but that, that was a great movie. Great movie. If you ever get a chance to see it, or you can find it on the internet, King of Comedy, 1982. Let's see, I'm, I'm looking at IMDb. Just to make sure that I got all the actors' names right. Gotta have to agree with Tom. 
miscast. It was made, I think, about a year after it. And so I think it was really a step down for Earl Holloman. He didn't really play a teenager in this role, but he just he just wasn't the right person for the role. But after Forbidden Planet, I think he could have done something better. Okay, one actor that I did like, and I was glad it probably made the movie at least tolerable, or at least watchable anyway, was Fred Clark. A bunch of stuff. Uh, he was in Sunset Boulevard, which is one of my favorite movies with William Holden and uh, yeah, what was uh, Gloria Swanson great part Gloria Swanson really played a great part she almost she played a caricature of herself but it was an intentional intentional caricature and uh, Sunset Boulevard is another rec movie I'd highly recommend if you ever get to see that Jack Webb's got a small part in it Great movie. List here. Uh, the other one that I liked in here was uh, Williams, who played Jerry Lewis's, Jerry Lewis's boss. His, you know, his boss on Planet Fringus or wherever it was. He was in a, a number of Alfred Hitchcock movies with Humphrey, well, one he was with, with Humphrey Bogart in Sabrina, and also he was in uh, L.M. for Murder, and with Cary Grant and Grace Kelly in To Catch a Thief. Witness for the Prosecution. So, three great movies right there. Williams. I might have to turn that off. Uh, um, now i got to get back to it. Uh, okay, here I am. Sorry about that. Uh, I had Gail Gordon, another actor uh, who's been around forever. He was in Armis Brooks, if you guys are old enough to remember that. I remember the TV show with Eve Varden. And Richard Crenna played the teenager in that one. Uh, Gil Gordon uh, had kind of that, he played kind of, kind of the snotty character, which he always liked to play. But he was on the on the radio program. Uh, I, I like old time radio. I know Tom doesn't, but uh, Armis Brooks and stuff. It was it was great on the radio, and he was you know better than he even was on TV. Uh, there was Lee Patrick, who played Reba in this movie. Now, she was another great actress that I really liked. Uh, she was in uh, another one of my favorite movies, The Maltese Falcon. Great uh, great movie. Another one, if you haven't seen that, and I can't believe you haven't, but if you somehow lived on Planet Fringus and you haven't watched it, I mean, you're missing a great movie, one of the all-time best movies. Uh, she she was also in Vertigo and the Joan Crawford movie, Mildred Pierce. Three great movies. Definitely uh, some of the best movies ever made, in my opinion. And let's see. Uh, Lawson, who, was, who she played the beatnik dancer. I had to go look it up on I look her up on IS, uh, on uh, IMDb because I thought for sure it was Shirley uh, McLean doing an un, you know uh, one of these untitled because it, it almost.
almost looked like Shirley, like a young Shirley MacLaine. But it was Barbara Desmond, and it turned out that uh, she was a friend of Shirley MacLaine and was even brought to Hollywood by Shirley MacLaine, although she didn't do anything of note. But she looked just like Shirley MacLaine in this movie. So that that's my... On the characters, so back to that KG5B. Okay, let's see who's next. KG5BZW, Jay. This is KG5BZW. Um, okay, so turn the radio down. I often, uh, I don't know, the characters, it, it, I'm just kind of bring up James's point. Um, it, it really felt like watching a sitcom. Um, just, uh, so it, it's, it's a comedy, it, you had the skeptic that becomes non-skeptic. It, 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 it's, it's, I mean, there's just so many stereotypes kind of being banged about here. Um, from the beatniks to the, um, uh, the, uh, even the, the, um, you know, alien boss slash, uh, professor slash whatever. He was. Um, I I I think it's. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm not sure that there's anything really much interesting to say. I, I'm guessing. I don't know. I, I don't really have much to say about this. Uh, I think uh, the actors playing the characters are more interesting than the characters themselves. Um, and you know when you you're dealing with characters in a comedy role, well, I think well, at least in some comedies, I guess comedies can be i mean like if you go with something like a uh, mash or something, I mean that's a drama the drama drama comedy where you know a lot of stuff happens, and um you know it, it, you're not sure what exactly is going to happen, but when when you got something that's like this, which is, it, it really felt like an extended sitcom. Uh, there's not much room for it, for uh, you know character growth or anything like that. Just kind of stock characters that just did their thing, and um, um, that's that. I guess that's all I can really say. KG Five BCW. Okay, uh, KG5PM and James. This is KG5PM and, um, since I'm not one a Jerry Lewis fan to begin with, I can't really comment too much on how his character was and, uh, or his acting and, um, what his normal characterization is in the movies, but I thought that he kind of played the lead in this fairly well as being the extraterrestrial and trying to go around and doing what he did with his ear and uh, making the police officers uh, rise up and then the car go up. And uh, I thought he played the lead fairly well. Um, that uh, I guess the boyfriend slash hus- husband that he loped. Um, he started out as a little on the goofy side to me when he first showed up in that spacesuit and the way he acted at that time. And I don't know that I ever got really got over him being a little on the goofy side. But uh, and I guess the father was trying to be the matriarch, uh, the matriarch type uh, character in the movie, and you know the lead and um, the father figure that knows 
everything is supposed to be going on. Um, and then I uh, don't know what the one character was that kind of acted like a uh, Melbourne Drysdale on the Beverly Hillbillies, the, the banker. Um, there was one character in there that kind of reminded me of him. And I'll send it back to the net, KG5PMN. Um, hello, KF5TSK, go ahead. Oh, this is KF5TSK. Well, I would say I was uh, really happy with all the characters. I, uh, uh, you know, thought, uh, you know, the plot moved along well, and it was, you know, everything that I would expect from a movie from 1960. Uh, the only thing that really bothered me was uh, uh, Mrs. Spelling, that dress she was wearing. And it's like, uh, you know, initially she was just walking around the house, but uh, I kept wondering how was she going to get in the car with that dress on. And uh, they also showed another scene that were uh, going down the stairs, and I was like, well, how do you go down the stairs if you can't? see where the steps are, you know, um, but, you know, overall, I was happy with the movie, uh, I enjoyed it, it was entertaining, like I said, it didn't in insult me, technically, so, uh, you know, it was just entertaining, can't find to just get back to net. Skirts, 
you can just imagine, it's not a pretty sight. So, yeah, and, and you know, movies with hoop skirts just the gags, you know, where they flop up or, or you can't get through the door or can't get in the car. And uh, it's just, a, you know, kind of a setup for that. Um, the mom, the wife, uh, she was such a stereotypical mom wife. Here, eat. You need to eat. Here, I made sandwiches. Here's some coffee. Just constantly shoving food into people's faces. And uh, I remember the other characters, like like the girl. You know, she's very flirty, but oh no, I'm Chase. And uh, the boy, they just can't wait to marry her, like right now. No, we can't wait to actually have a wedding. You gotta get married right this minute, because you just can't wait. Uh, there's a lot of stereotypes in this, um, which I think helps give it a, a, a an extreme level that uh, I guess contributed to the movie. Um, let's see, who else? Um, they were, they talked about the women, uh, aliens, but never showed us any. Um, I don't know why they didn't have any on their crew. That would have been an interesting, uh, thing to, um, uh, to explore. And he's like, there are women, you know, we, we don't have, uh, romance anymore. And yet he's just like... You know, anybody else, you know, sees a pretty girl and he's ready to go. So you'd think that that would have been lost on their planet. Uh, but apparently not. All right. That is all I have uh, about characters. Do we have any more check-ins? Am I being 
somewhat indifferent? Yeah, I am, because this movie uh, wasn't as much fun as the play was that I was in. Did I tell you I played Conrad? KE5ICX. Yes, I believe you did. Uh, and, and that's wonderful. Mike, KG5P, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Ken Brenda, KG5P. Well, I think this, the effects are just about appropriate for this movie. Uh, they didn't take anything away. They added just enough to get the point across. Uh, you know, this was no... Uh, You know, it's, it's, the contemporary movie on this was, of course, Forbidden Planet. And this was no Forbidden Planet, but then it was supposed to be. So, you know, the flying saucer and the, the, kind of like the space suit, you know, those aluminum or whatever they were. Vinyl, al aluminum covered vinyl or whatever those space suits were. Uh, I guess they had to put them in something and... It was better than having fish bowls over their heads. Uh, the flying saucers was about what you would expect. You know, it was just part of the movie. Uh, they made their point. The outer space scenes when he was zipping around planets and making sure you don't run into the moon or Mars or whatever. The special effects were, were what they were, and they, and they, were, they were okay. They, like I said, they didn't add anything to it, but they, they were appropriate. That's all I have to say on that, KG5P. Hey, um, KG5PZWJ. This is a KG5BZW. Okay, okay, golly. Uh, uh, I don't, that, um, uh, <laughs> uh, ignoring that, um, um, yeah, uh, I, I actually was kind of impressed that the, the, the effects were not overly corny or anything, um, I guess the most, uh, um, the most obvious, you know, sci-fi effect was the ship and, well, you know, it was, you know, appropriate for the era. Um, uh, and actually, I'd say, I don't know, it seems a little bit better than some things we've seen. So, I mean, I think the, every single effect, I, that is the one one thing I, I think I really like about this movie is, like, every, every special effect that I could think of, uh, even the... Dogs, uh, the talking dog, and oh, what else? Everything just seemed to be appropriate. So let's just put it that way. I'm I'm kind of echoing what Mike just said, but there was it it, it I I can't fault this find any fault on this film with the uh, special effects. Um, the actually I have to admit even the the, the beatnik uh, scene. Um. Yeah, they had the the the, uh, the, the self playing bongos. Uh, I thought that was that was actually kind of nice, even though you know it's not like it's going to be that hard to figure out how to do that. But it's still, the, uh, the effect was nice. Uh, the flying car. Um, even that, uh, it, it it looked you know it didn't. Look too bad. It, it sure, you know, you you could see that as a fact, but um, it, it just didn't seem out of place. So yeah, uh, that's I think another plus I have for this film. The the effects were not out of place. Uh, KG five BZW. Hey, Mike. Five P M N James. 
This is KG5 PM, and um, like everybody else, I thought the uh, special effects were kind of flowed along with the with the uh, plot of the show, and um, they were fairly good. None of them were really too, I guess, outlandish, or um, um, thought that they were too 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 uh, off the mark. Um, the dog and the cat kind of talking, that was kind of, kind of humorous, and, um, the flying car fit right in, because he, he made the point of taking off when that guy talked to him in the truck, and says, well, it's not going to be a problem, or something like that, and so it just kind of flowed along with the rest of the show. KG5 PM in, back to the net. Okay, KF5 PSK Pearl. Uh, this is KF5 PSK. Well, I had two things on special effects, and what was Jerry Lee Lewis? You know, he walked up the wall and walked on the ceiling, and Miss Spelling says, "Well, you should walk up there because it's hard to clean those foot uh, foot marks. You know, when you walk on the ceiling." Uh, I, I didn't really expect, you know, something like that would. Uh, actually occur, but, um, you know, he seemed to be perfectly comfortable however he was doing it. I don't know, um, you know, how that, you know, stunt was actually, uh, affected, but, uh, it looked very natural, you know, with him just walking up the wall and walking on the ceiling. Uh, also, I thought the dog, you know, <laughs> He was probably the most exceptional uh, character in the whole movie that, uh, you know, he saw something that, you know, frightened him. You know, he could go hide. Uh, you know, he could be friendly when he needed to be friendly. He could talk when he needed to, you know, talk to someone. Oh, well, uh, you know, you and the cat need to be friends. And it's like, oh, well, I'll go give the cat a lick, you know. Uh, can't find this game back to net. Okay, W5 EBB David, special effects. Well, as Brent Spiner can attest, dogs are much better actors than cats. Cats do not take directions very well. Um, now the spaceship and space effect wasn't too good. It looked from a distance not too unlike Saturn. Uh, or from a greater distance, uh, the Andromeda Galaxy. Um, now, the stage, stage special effects, those which didn't require special optics or post-edited hand-drawn in-frame uh, add, add-ons, it was done well. The levitation effects were done well. Apparently mastered as of 1960. I couldn't see the cantilevered support beam holding the table and the attached chair uh, next to the wall. Nor can I see the wire holding up the levitated people or dog. Uh, it's very well done. Um, and it, as for what Burl was mentioning, it, it looked like the entire set was rotating. You can usually sort of detect that when the person, his tilt angle sort of changes as it's rotating around and he's getting a firmer step on the next 90-degree angle. And of course, that technique was, was used also in uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey, W5EBB. Yeah, well, uh, Jerry Lewis was the uh, master of that kind of stuff. He had a very good sense of physicality and uh, pratfalls and such, so um, I don't think he had to work real hard to learn how to do that. I thought that was very effective, and, and it, is, they, it probably really wowed people at the time, and uh, uh, it was an amazing effect. Um, I, I thought the space effects were just cheesy. I agree, the stage effects were just fine, but the space ones were a little bit unbelievable and cheesy. Okay, uh, any additional seconds? Okay, if you want to have one more stab at this, 
come with your call, and uh, we'll go around. We won't do a whole rotation. Just if you have something to say, just give us your call sign. We beat the dead aliens to uh, death. Um, okay, Tom, what do you have for next week? K5 ICX. if you're a time traveler. So uh, that'll be next week's movie. I don't know what it's about. I, I, I hope it's better than Visit to a Small Planet. So, Supernova, 2005. If you would like to be a part of the um, group, that, it's the cool kids that get the information early, you can go ahead and sign up on Facebook, Afterglow Movie, two words, Afterglow and Movie on Facebook, and we'll put you on the list. Uh, if you would like to not bother with Facebook, you just want to be on the email, or you would just like a reminder, uh, send an email to KE5ICX, kilo 5 India Charlie X-Ray at yahoo.com. Say you want to join the Africa Movie Group, and I will put you on the list. Uh, that's it for me, KE5ICX. Thanks to everyone who participated. This is wb 5 ozl clear and closing out the net. Thank you, Brenda. Good job, KG5B.